That's a really loud fly. Hey guys, it's John from Ride Upstate, and today I have an interview with Steve, the chief driver advocate, and Dave, the co-founder of Para. We're going to be talking about what is Para doing with your data. Let's jump right into it. Well, I appreciate your time, guys. Um, uh, like I said, there's been I've been seeing a lot of people asking about what's going on with my data, what are they doing with my data, um, and I mean, I know from having talked to uh, Jimmy early on, and I think even at, at one point I even talked to talked to Jeff on the phone. You know, what Jeff told me about there was a comment on 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 the the Facebook post that I put up, like, "Oh, I want to know what they're doing with encryption and and all this other stuff," and I'm just like. 99% of the people don't even understand how that works. <laughs> That's not even a convert. This isn't a technical conversation. So um, what I'll do is I want to start out because, because uh, Steve, I think other than the rideshare, uh, rideshare guys interview that you just recently did, I don't think you've really, I haven't seen you on YouTube or anything like that talking about, uh, talking about para. So uh and i know well, a lot not, of people not not, not to youtube but on but, the podcast and on and actually on jason's channel yeah on youtube mm -hmm. um so i mean i'm just not i'm just not a youtube guy yeah i yeah, mean i, I go it. on youtube and i watch a lot of your stuff and other people's stuff and like that but i just don't do a lot of youtube myself yeah yeah but all right so uh let's start with that um let's start uh with with steve um you are the Para's driver advocate, right? Is that is that your title? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at the website. Chief no, driver I mean, advocate. <laughs> yep. So, um, so, but, so but, what, the, but so the most part that? too, it's it's whatever, you know, if whatever is needed. I mean, it's it's a small team at Para. So if David said, Hey, you know, what do you know about this? Or, you know, could you look into this? Or I'm 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 that I'm the I'm a go-to, but I consider everybody else there a go-to too. Um, I do have quite a, I have, do have quite a few things to say to, about on this, on this topic. I'm sure David does too. I feel like a lot of this stuff came about with the privacy. Um, once there were some hiccups with a free app that people are benefiting from, but what people need to also take a big step back and look at is anytime you put your, your name and your email into anything, you, that company now in your mind should become suspect to your data privacy. Right. Absolutely. Because I mean, that's basically, you know, you can't have a profile in an app and not put an email and name. And some people might argue that and say, well, you can download games and it just loads them up for you. Yeah. It already has your information from Apple. Right. Exactly what we're talking about. It's already being fed your information and it's already populated it even to the point of advertising. The advertising right. through a game might be different for me than it would for you. Right. So, right. I mean, those little things, like to me, I don't know. I, I, David, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like a lot of people, everybody that's used the app has benefited from it. Some people have questioned whether it's, you should use the app since the DoorDash policy says don't. Independent contractors are, by definition, allowed to use all the tools at their disposal. That said, DoorDash does have a policy that you can't use the two tools at your disposal. So there's a lot of questionability going on here, but it's like, you know, when the app hits a couple hiccups, people start complaining. So my, I guess my, my thing that I'd like to see how David answers is, are these people new to the group? Are these, are these people who have been happy for in tip transparency group for month and now they're going crazy? Like, having a, you know little spasms yeah. or are these kind of newer i think my read is a couple things right so i think uh, one we believe very heavily in data privacy and in fact that's sort of one of the driving philosophies of our company i think that's why steve and i you know we started working on sort of COVID tools for gig workers but sort of really a lot exactly. this is why this is upsetting to me because david and i were about everything against this and I think sort of our philosophy really is, is like, this is your data as a driver. You should be able to have the extra context around your pings. If you want a tool where multiple platforms send a ping into that makes your life easier, your right as an independent contractor is to be able to have, to have a tool that makes your life easier. 
So we're just taking full advantage of what it means to be an independent contractor. Uh, but I also understand where a lot of people come from, right? So we're asking for a hard thing, you know, in order to enable this tip transparency, we're asking for people's login information, right? That's a tough right. ask. And I think it really right. took us a little bit to build trust with people, right? Uh, and the only, you know, you know, when we first launched the group, you know, I sort of did a video every day, made sure we're super responsive with everyone. And I think really we were able to build trust. And now we have tens of thousands of people using the app the hard way, basically, right? Mm -hmm. Which is people right. are using it, we're making them money, uh, it works, and we are there every step of the way if you have any issues as much as we can be as a small team. Right. So I think for us, it's like having built that trust, I believe we have the trust of a lot of people. I think there's a part of this too where there are people who are inherently skeptical. Uh, I get that, right? So you have right. a, you know, some other YouTubers who are saying it's a scam, et cetera, et cetera. But to me, sort of the proof's in the pudding. So we have a bunch of people who are skeptical, but we have tens of thousands of other people who are using it super happily, uh, making money. Uh, so uh, I think it's a matter of trying to just continue to build trust, basically. I think, you know, right. I can talk a little more about the way it's technically done, but as you said, sort of, I'm not sure that would help uh, right. that many people. The answer is basically it's behind a Google server. Uh, it's encrypted with a single key per login. So there's no way that, you know, we've had a couple of group members who work in networking who actually before, they were sort of skeptical and basically try to poke our system before chatting with me. And mm -hmm. I think that was sort of uh, made me smile, <laughs> at least is when we had like a lady who's like, I work in networking security for name big phone company. And I tried to hack the shit out of you guys. Um, <laughs> before our conversation and it checked out, right? I'm like, that makes right. me happy. That's a good thing, yeah. right? And yeah. you know, people like that have ended up being our biggest advocates, right? People who are initially skeptical, uh, come and talk to us, poke it, see the details. And then basically those people have then gone on to be our best advocates. Definitely. Right, yeah. I've been in IT for a long time, over 30 years. And um, I, am, I, I am skeptical of every app I put my information in, you know, and, and, when and if if that app starts misbehaving guess what i'm going to let them know and i haven't seen anything like that uh with with para so there's kind of two categories of information that that get put into the app the first is when you just register to use the app so you're putting in your name and your phone number uh, and, an, and an email address so let let's start with that information before we get to the login information um, so that's used to create your account. And then, and then what does PARA use that data for or what doesn't PARA use that data for? Yeah, good question. So I think that's most of that information at the login is basically for, call it Google authentication, right? So it's a way for us to know that if you're logging into the app, this is you. So that's why the phone number, the code that gets texted, et cetera. So it's a uh, in a prior versions of the app, we had a lighter sign up, but I think the idea being if we are putting a bunch of your work information in one place, pulling pings on behalf of you, actually asking for more information to have your account more secure makes sense, basically, right? Because right? if we are then having an environment in which we're asking for your login information for other apps you work on, having that secure is super, super, super important, obviously. Yeah, very important. Uh, Steve, do you have anything to, to add? Um. You know, I think David said it well, but to be honest, I think that I think that Para takes some of the most minimal amounts of data that I've seen that any app needs for you to download the app, and yet it's an app that's making you three to four times as much money. Right. You right. know, You're I mean, not like, a lot of these apps my... don't do anything for 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 money for you. And they need three times, which I mean, three times is only six pieces of information or nine <laughs> pieces of inf information, but that's nine pieces. The more information each company gathers, the more they have to sell. We've seen this with rideshare companies that try and right. launch. And I, you know, my, my interview with the rideshare guy, just the other day, we got into a conversation about how some of these have just popped up and data farmed and then gone under because it's very easy to put up a splash page that says, Hey, we're a new rideshare company and we're, you know, based out of such and such, but we're launching everywhere next week. You, you can't launch everywhere next week. You don't have any drivers. You don't have any passengers. You don't have any data, but then you see the site go down three months later. You people should be, or anybody that's doing 
gig work should be way more concerned if you entered into that database. Right. Because that was yeah. literally just set up to, to get your data, close it down. They prop, I mean, potentially never even had intention of opening. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, I mean, let us, let that... us not forget trip rides, everybody. I mean, they <laughs> straight up sold your information to everybody that would buy it. Right. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of information you guys aren't collecting. You're not collecting my age, my income level, whether or not I've been to college, uh, you know, all these, all this kind of information that you see. Uh, I mean, you don't even ask to know where I live really, unless I want to join a local chat or something like that. Um, so, so there's very little data that you're actually collecting on that. So, uh, so then the question, so the follow-up question would be is, okay, are you selling the data and, and what are you doing with the data? Yeah. So we're not selling the data. We have no plans to sell the data. And what we're, I think going back to what I said earlier, the philosophy really is we want a secure environment in which you as an independent contractor have access to your data basically, right. right? So really yeah. our business is taking the data that is yours, putting it into one place and helping you, you know, what we're building towards is like a personal dispatch system on behalf of the driver, mm -hmm. right? So it's like our goals are helping you access your data, making informed decisions and having a tool that put the power in your hands, basically. That's really where we're coming from. So, you know, there are other platforms out there who want to sell your data to platforms, want to sell your data to cities, et cetera, et cetera. We have, we have no interest in that. Our interest is in building the best damn driver app for the drivers. Right. Yeah. So, um, so then there's a second set of data that has to go in, which is the credentials for Uber, for Lyft, for DoorDash. And of course, the only way you're going to be able to actually get that data from those systems is if you have that information to uh, tap into the API. So uh, I don't know if either one of you can answer this or not. Let's, I mean, we can get, try and get as technical as, as we can for some of these, for some of these people. Um, so once you make that initial connection, every time you connect, are you sending my username and password or do you then get like a logon key from the API that says, okay, I recognize you. You don't have to log in every, every time you come talk to me. You are asking a very good question with that. It is the latter. So it's a, once we have that connection, there's an ongoing connection. There's a bunch of sort of wizardry we do around reviewing that connection, right? But uh, essentially what happens is you're giving us that information. We're storing it in a, you know, individual encryption key, Google top of the line standard environment. We use that to create a connection with the API and we maintain that relationship. We actually don't use uh, that login information again. Okay. And then when you log into those accounts, so let's just go with DoorDash because the tip transparency is the biggest thing. Um, when, you, when you log into my account, um, are you pulling any data out? Are you, you know, I saw someone the other day make a statement of, oh, they can, they can see your driver's license. Uh, can you see my driver's license when you log into DoorDash? I can't see your driver's license. The one I've heard a lot also is, can you access my bank account? I certainly can't access your bank account. Uh, what we're doing is effectively we are getting access for your account to the API with DoorDash and basically opening a door that says, when you get pings, send us the ping info, which we can then use to provide you extra context, Right. basically. So when you get that email that's like, hey, we're connecting to your account, effectively it's the doors open with the API and the only info that we are pulling is uh, related to that trip information that's coming in. Right, so you're essentially doing what people were doing with the two phone trick, where they had a second phone, they side loaded an older version of the app that did show you all of the payout information. And then they use that app, that second phone, to determine whether or not they wanted to take to take the ride, to Some, take the somewhat. delivery. Yeah, I, yeah, I, mean, I was going to go say I was going to say that um, I would I would relate it more to okay when you sign up for any website that you now want to I mean maybe it's not even an app a website they start asking you questions some are required some are not required fields. And sometimes it's like, how do you want us to communicate with you via phone, via email, via text? I kind of think of it like that as a fourth option or via my, my other way. 
is how I would word it, I guess, other. And Mm -hmm. other in this case would be para. So you're kind of allowing this other thing to be your communic another communication method. I don't know the, the, the whole thing here to me, that's why I was asking David, if a lot of these people have been people who have been very happy with para up till now, or if we're seeing people coming in, because I've seen just recently, even on YouTube, I've seen some DoorDash uh, people who do YouTube channels who have kind of been either pro para or not pro para. And if they're not pro para, it seems like their, their audience must be, you know, it's, it's like, you know, you, you know, you're taking a risk by doing this. Well, we've all, I mean, we've never denied that, but I mean, you'd almost, in my book, you'd almost have to turn yourself in to well, get well, caught you, using this. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, and, and I don't even want to use the word caught again, independent contractors should have, I know it's in the terms, but all the, nobody ever reads these terms. I would bet yeah. that one in 10,000, not even one in 20,000 people read the terms that they're accepting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is why the other day I actually said, you know, we're not really independent contractors. Uh, We're also not regular employees. There really needs to be, I think, a different classification for what it is people do. Um, Well, that's what London did. Yeah. They created the work, the worker status. Right. Right. For gig Um, gig workers. So, so you're not logging into my account every time you're not, you're not data mining my account or anything like that to build this list of, Hey, we're going to sell this off and, uh, and make even more money than, than, than we are right now. Uh, which I believe right now, since you're still kind of in, in funding, you're not technically making any money, uh, because I no, one's, for us, paying, no really, one's paying for the app, you know? Yeah. No one's paying for the app for us. It's really is if we can build a driver app that makes drivers money, that's our goal mm-hmm. basically. Right. Uh, and it's just this idea of, yeah, you should have tools which can make your life easier and you should be able to have competition for your time. And the way to do that is just to make it super simple to evaluate all your options in one place. Basically. Right, right. We have seen, and, and this, this, is, this is a question that, that came up is, um, and you sort of mentioned this, Steve, is have you all gotten any response from DoorDash? Has DoorDash contacted you and said, hey, we're going to cut you off? Um, we have seen that they're starting to release more information about, you know, you're starting to see a little bit more of the payout than you, on than you used to on, on some, on some, some markets, of the trips. Yeah. Um, so have you guys heard from DoorDash? Has, has, has anyone from DoorDash contacted you and said, you guys need to cut this out or, or anything like that? We have not at all. And I think what's interesting is at this point, uh, a decent percentage of active door dashers on any given week are using the para system, like in the double digit percentages. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So like, it's quite a large percent of their users. We haven't heard anything from them. And I think it's interesting, uh, you know, we're friendly with sort of a Joe Middleton at Middleton Tech, who's the sort of driver utility helper. And I think yep. what his experience was, is he got cease and desists very quickly from DoorDash, right? Mm-hmm. And it ended up being smoothed over and ended up being fine. Uh, But we haven't heard anything like that from them. And my two cents, to be honest, is, you know, call me an idealist, maybe, but I think they realize that they're in the wrong on this, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in an ideal world, they would just do this for everybody all the time and tip transparency would be useless, frankly. It's just the right thing. Uh, So it's going to be interesting. We haven't heard anything. Uh, uh, We haven't heard anything, no. And uh, I think we've been very glad that we can conclusively say that nobody who's used para has been deactivated for using para. And I think I want to reiterate that because there's been a couple of these videos or posts online where people have been claiming that this has happened, right? And as far as, you know, that's super important to us. Firstly, Mm -hmm. if that were to happen, I would probably be the first to know very angrily from a user and rightfully so, right? right? And second of all, we would do everything in our power to make sure that we fix that or get that resolved. But a lot of this stems from there was a person who made a post in a couple of groups, one saying that he was deactivated for para, and the second saying he knows somebody who was deactivated for using para. And when he looked him up, he'd never signed up for para, had never connected an account, and was never in our system. So basically, <laughs> it's one of these where, you know, That's I don't what know I was what you want to about. call it. Yeah, but it's just somebody who feels like they need to save other people by making up a story. Right. Exactly. And we've seen this turn into, oh, lots of people have been deactivated for using para. 
Uh, it's just not true. And I, you know, people, some people won't believe me for saying this, but like we take every single one of these, anytime anyone has said anything about deactivation, that is super serious to us. Yeah. Right. And I think uh, we really spend a lot of our time and effort to make sure that one, that doesn't happen. And two, to make sure that the way we built this technically uh, is ahead of the game and it won't happen. Basically. Yeah. Well, and I, I would think that you would see it uh, on I, your I, end, I, I, I say to, 500 to... people suddenly got deactivated. I mean, you know, 500 people don't change their password all at the same time. And suddenly your no. app doesn't have access anymore to their accounts. <clears throat> I, I need Correct. to say one quick thing to, to David's comment too, John, is that um, I've gotten to know David really well over the last year. He's gotten to know me. That doesn't help the people viewing this. However, it does. If you listen to the our podcast or you know David or whatever, it does a little. But honestly, if one, two people really truly were in the Para app and were and were kicked off DoorDash platform, knowing David as I do, I almost I would be shocked almost if he didn't shut the app down until it was figured out. That's how seriously he would take that because if you go back to the beginning of David and my relationship at the very beginning of the pandemic and listen to some of the podcasts in the beginning, we were doing everything we could. I mean, this is why this is so wild to me. We were doing everything we could to make sure that people's data was safe. Mm -hmm. And we weren't even doing anything yet to get people's data. We were helping people with PUA and we were helping to make sure that people were staying safe and all this. And it's, it's like, it goes against everything that, our friendship was based on and how we got to know each other and work together. It's like, you know, I don't know if, if you want to, if you, if you want to be worried about data theft, you should go into every app on your phone and be concerned. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's true. Um, so I mean, do, does, does para have plans to monetize the app? Um, I know, Oh my gosh, probably at the beginning of the year or even late last year when I was talking to Jimmy, um, I was talking to a li him a little bit saying, oh, you could try this. You could, you know, you could try a lot of these different things. You could, I mean, you know, Gridwise throws ads in their app. Um, but again, you'd have to provide Google or Apple with data in order to, to, to make money off those, make money off those ads. And, and, and you're essentially giving that data, you know, to those, to those platforms, to those stores, um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that that you could you could monetize the app. Do you have plans to monetize the app? And it, it's interesting to me that people ask that because I ask it because I want the app to continue. I don't want it to go away. I want to see features added um, because yep. and and the only way to do that is to monetize is to monetize it. You guys can't work for free. You know. Um, Right. I also but, love that people are asking that, right? I think people are becoming more aware of like, how is a business or a company, <laughs> how can it have longevity, right? How right. can I make sure that if there is no revenue, they're not just selling my data to make money, right? I think it's awesome that more and more people are asking that. I think that's super important, right? I think very good question on your end. So really what we're trying to do is what you'll see over the next couple of months is we're going to do a similar type transparency thing for other platforms, Right. And I think as part of that, it is transparency for other platforms, but also this idea of being able to bring all of those platforms into one same place and to run that, you know, auto accept and decline being one part of it. But the dream I have is like it's a dispatch tool that represents you and your sets of preferences that take all the inbound and all the different pings and do the smart stuff for you basically right. representing what your goals are. Do you want to stay in this area? Do you want to make this sort of money? Do you have these sort of preferences? Uh, but basically sort of getting competition for your time or you know, looking at the options for your time. So I think in a world in which we have that system fully up and running and doing super well for people, I could see a world in which maybe we start to charge a driver some small amount per month. Uh, but I would only feel comfortable doing that when this machine is humming, basically. Sure. Uh, sure. You know, in terms of sort of long-term monetization, uh, obviously, I think at some point, you know, we would have to pay ourselves uh, as a team. Uh, so I think what you will see is uh, not anytime soon, but at some point we'd have to think through, is there some other way to generate revenue? But I think from our perspective, uh, 
if we build this tool and make life easier for people and make money for people, uh, we will, you know, then we could feel comfortable maybe charging a couple bucks per month, but that's a sure. long way. Sure. Yeah. yeah. You had mentioned uh, when, when I first invited you, uh, Steve, you brought up Maestro and how they would, they would hack my Uber and Lyft would make changes to their API. So Maestro wouldn't work. Um, uh, or they would just or, go through and scrape all the APIs and then Maestro right. would just reconnect. Yeah. I yeah. mean, same as the new CEO of Maestro, who's now taken over, told me not long ago. Um, he, you know, it, it was very blatant. He just said, I said, well, you know, what about when they scrape those? He said, well, my team's better than theirs and we get it back up in minutes. <laughs> yeah. So it's, yeah. and that's, that is the bottom line. I mean, like, People say like, you know, how can your team be better? You know, Uber has 6,000 people. Well, because they don't really care. They're just bottom feeders. Well, and and when you have a smaller team, they can be more nimble. They can make changes a lot faster than than a company like Uber or Lyft can. Because they're, I mean, I personally, I think Uber has way too much in their app myself. Yeah. Um, it causes it well, to like if you have engaged people and you also have users who believe in it, right. I think that's really important for us, right? Is when we see users who would go debug things for us, we'll flag that something is up, right? It's the power of that group of people, sure. right? It's like, you know, no single coder at Uber can beat hundreds of people looking out for something, right? right. And I think that's really sort of the beauty of what we have going is this community of tens of thousands of people who are just super passionate about this, right? And that's really the secret sauce is we have good coders, don't get me wrong, uh, but it's the combination of coding plus, you know, just the group, basically. Sure, sure. So David, you mentioned transparency on other apps, and those were some questions that came up. Um, we're starting to see evidence come out that that Uber Eats is not showing the full tip. They're only showing about up to $8 in some markets. Uh, and a lot of people were asking about with Grubhub being able to see the mileage on Grubhub. Are those some of the things that that you guys are are, are looking into and, and and pulling that data in? So again, you know, if I take an Uber Eats order, I mean, there could be an $8 tip on a trip. But for example, in my market, that trip could be 15 or 20 miles away easily because yeah. my market, I'm at the top of my top of my zone and it's 29 miles long and, yeah. and 11 miles wide. So I could, be, I could easily drive 15 or 20 miles to deliver something. Uh, you know, I'll still be somewhere where I could get more, get more orders. Yeah. But if I know that it's a $15 tip instead of an $8 tip, you know, making the total go from, you know, 25, you know, up to 30, 30 plus dollars, you know, I might make a decision to take that trip, you know, yeah, I think uh, you're spot on. I think that's the common things we've heard, which is mileage on trip for both Grubhub and or, uh, yeah, mileage for trip for Grubhub, mileage for a stacked trip on Uber, right? So when you mm. get that second ping, they don't tell you how far that is, right. right? And I also think when it comes to Uber, there's this $8 hidden tip I've heard about. And the other one too, is they've been running it an experiment where unless you take five of the last 10 trips, you don't get any context on trips, mm. basically. Uh, so uh, I think uh, that's really sort of top of mind for us. Yes. Right. I think adding that extra transparency. And I think what I would love is uh, those are the two most common things we've heard. But if any of the listeners here have other things they would like or any other thoughts, please comment. Let me know. Uh, we're building a list of this. Right. So yeah. I think it's sort of the same approach could provide a bunch of other transparency, but we need help to understand what makes the most sense. Yeah, I think that's something uh, we'll that we play with a couple other things, right? Where it's like, you know, is it an apartment or not? There's a couple right. of these other fun tweaks you could do also. Right. I think that's something that a lot of people don't don't realize is that you actually want to hear from the people who are using the app. You know, if you have, I don't know, I think there's somewhere around twenty two to twenty five thousand people using the app right now, and if two thousand people say, "Hey, we would really like this," I mean, you you kind of know what to target. At, at that point when it, when it comes to the, you know, the, the, the development process. Um, I mean, you've got the group, uh, you know, you've got people constantly saying, why doesn't it do this? Why doesn't it do that? Um, you know, one big question was when are you guys going to add mileage tracking? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> yeah, but because I love it, right? Thing. I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's we're yeah, trying to build the best damn tool for the community, right? So I think really hearing from people is the best way for us to determine what to build, really, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and well, I just John, have, I'd like to, yeah, I'd like ahead, to real quick hit on, hit on the maestro thing too, because I, I was sure. sitting here thinking and I'm thinking that a lot of dashers, <laughs> you guys know this, but a lot of people might not know this who haven't been in gig economy for four, four years, I guess, at least. Maestro is back around now and has been for about a year under a new CEO. Maestro was completely down for two years. Right. So if dashers have been in the gig economy for four years, okay, this might make sense to you. But if you go back four years in time to any new dashers watching this who are skeptical, I, I ask any of you to go back and look at the history of Maestro. People were very stoked by Maestro. I mean, this was not a thing. I mean, they had some of their attacks too. Like, are you selling my data? Are you doing this? And they just kind of shut that down. Like, don't use our app. No, if you're so right. concerned, don't use our app. That was their stance. They really sort of trailblazed this with sort of the Uber and Lyft. And I think it's uh, even more so now is the time to do it because of uh, more apps than before. Uh, I think the fact that drivers are getting smart to the fact that their independent contractors let's take advantage of that and how can i use my data that is mine and my pings so i think it's sort of a maestro really let set off this fire and i think right now it's just sort of the perfect time between the cultural zeitgeist around drivers being essential workers around independent contracting around data ownership i just think that uh right now's the time for something like now's the time that we can build something like this. And I'm super excited about that. Yeah. And, you know, recently we've seen this conversation around safety for drivers, you know, and um, depending on the time of the day, there are some neighborhoods you may not want to deliver into, you know, and, and you get a ping and you don't have that information. And like you said, with a, with a stacked order on, on Uber Eats or with Grubhub and you're going into a neighborhood and suddenly you're there and you're going, okay, I don't think I want to be here right now, you know? Yeah. And, I think and it goes back to that transparency, right? It's like, you should just be able to make an informed decision for what you feel is best for yourself, right? right? And right. it should just be easy, easy to do that. And I think that was really uh, the philosophy where we started these COVID tools, Steve, when I started for yes. Steve was basically like, why is it so hard to understand what you need to do? It shouldn't be that hard, basically, <laughs> right? It's like, it shouldn't be this hard. It doesn't have to be this hard. Uh, this is not cool, basically. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you know, going, going back to that tool about getting the, uh, the, the, the loans and the grants and things, there were so many scams out. I remember seeing so many scams where people were like, oh yeah, send us all your data and we'll set it up for you. And, 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 and yeah. I mean, they may have I set mean, it up for you, but they had your data now. You know, and I mean, the yeah. biggest, What's funny the is biggest we did the opposite, we with it. right? We went to the government's website and just scraped all the answers is what we did, right? right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> we just went to like literally programmatically pinged their system and found all the answers. And we're like, well, you decide, but we'll give you the data and army to do it. I think that's really our, you know, coming full circle back to sort of the beginning of this conversation. That's really our philosophy, which is we get you your data and let you action on what should be yours, basically. Right. Right. It, and to it, be it, and to be honest, if you look at 2019, I mean the big or 2020, the biggest data theft that was going on was in unemployment insurance uh, unemployment insurance systems uh, that were programmed in COBOL from the 60s. Yeah, I, I saw mean that that's where California I mean, was sort of nuts. Is like X billion yeah. dollars in fraud and <laughs> unemployment. So, I think. Oh, way yeah. X X billion times X. I mean, it was yeah. really high. You guys were one of the worst or California was one of the worst states to really have an abuse on that. I, I don't, I mean, the every, basically every state's UI system was the biggest culprit of data theft management last year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so before we wrap up, I do have one more question, you know, as far, as far as the app is concerned, I have, I have noticed that uh, era does not update information from the various platforms that I'm on as often as it used to. I, yes. I'm assuming this is on purpose because of the number of people that are on the platform. Um, 
Can, can you just uh, speak to that a little yes. bit? Because people are going, I don't see my updates right away. Why is it taking yeah. so long for everything to the, update? The earnings tracking isn't working as well as we'd like it, right? Yeah. So I think uh, we've hit pause on that temporarily, mainly because there was an issue with getting the date, like, no, probably too many details, but the way the data is coming through the pipes, there is a bit of a clog. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our attention was being spent on making sure tip transparency is as awesome as it can be at the expense of, you know, if the tip transparency group wasn't grown so big, we would spend more effort making sure that that uh, earnings tracking uh, is better. So mm -hmm. I think uh, what I ask of people is please bear with us for a week or two here. Right now is it's not going to update and be the best for the next week or two, but we are working on uh, improvements that we think will also make the tracking also more real time. So I think what this conversation forced for us was it's not working perfectly right now. On top of that, we had a bunch of feedback from people saying, hey, the earning is only updating when I finish my dash. Hey, you know, it takes a couple hours for the info to come in. So I think we've started to look at the whole system with a critical eye. And I hope to have a bigger update about yeah. that in a couple yeah. of weeks. So. I will tell you that you guys aren't the only ones having trouble updating earnings information. Uh, there's other apps as well that I have installed on my phone yeah. that I play around with. And they are not yes. updating regularly either. So, uh, yeah. I, I, I would suspect the same suspect data that the pipe issue. Yeah, exactly. I would suspect the problem is it just on your end. <laughs> I think. Oh. I mean, I honestly think that these, you know, these platforms, they they don't want you pulling data out. You know, they want to keep you, like like the interview with with the DoorDash president, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we want to give you as much information as we can to entice you to take the next to take the next trip, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and that's really what it com what it comes down to is they want to they want to get as many. And and on one hand, I understand we want to get things delivered as fast as possible. But on the other hand, too, uh, I think we we also deserve to have that information and but the onus and, I think that's the part that annoys me is uh, the <laughs> onus shouldn't be on the driver, right? No, it should be transparent. And if customers want to pay a lower price that drivers won't pay, either the customer has to pay more, or that is right. a business decision made by DoorDash to subsidize these lower paying rides. In right. which case, DoorDash should assume the cost. Right? right, the shifting of the burden onto the driver just isn't fair. Well, that, right. this is, yeah, this is kind of one of the, one of the, you know, it, it, that's the difficulty with these apps because I'm of the opinion that DoorDash and Uber Eats and Grubhub should pay a livable wage. And if we get tips on top of that bonus, but instead what they do is they, they pay you, the base pay is as small as possible and they put it on the customer to tip um, you know, as in order to make up our pay, I mean, nearly every person on these platforms can look and see that anywhere between 40 and 70% yeah. of their income comes from tips. That's spot and on the for customers me. I, I already like paying fees yeah. on top of it. So yeah. PARA is not only good for us as drivers, it's good for customers too. Because the customer who pays more is going to get their order faster. They're going to get priority, um, and, and I think that's that's one of the facets that that people miss with this is this is good for the customer too. Well, I, one thing I have to say is that uh, I'll compare it to the bar industry, what you just said. And mm -hmm. when I was a bartender, bartending pay is two fifty five an hour in Colorado. I don't yeah. know if you know that. I mean, yeah, it's that, low. That's no, but that's le that's legal. That's the yeah. minimum wage yeah. for a bartender in the service industry. I think a lot of people don't know that. Of course, it relies on tips. But I think part of the transparency thing too is go back. If you're worried about your data, be worried about your data from DoorDash. Right. Don't worry about what Pair is doing. I mean, of course, worry what every app is doing. And one one thing I would like to say is like a, a final thought for me anyway is that go with your gut. If you if you're if you're just trolling the tip transparency site and just trying to create problems and stuff, obviously that we can't reach those people. Those people aren't going to listen. They're doing what they want to do and they're trolls. But I think if you're like true, what you're saying is trust is built over time, right? So if you're uncomfortable, 
sit on the sideline and watch. Right? That's what I was just. That's yeah. what I was just gonna say. I, I, go you know, I'm not gonna gut. push you if, to if, sign up for something you don't want to. Right. It's go just, go you know, with your gut. If you if you feel like you you're not comfortable with this, then don't use the app right now. Right. Bottom yeah. line. I mean, you know, I don't, but I, don't I think a lot to... of people are very comfortable. They know that we are, you know, we're, I mean, we're not the people you should worry about. Open your phone and look at the apps where there's a lot of other apps you have on your phone. You should worry about. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't think DoorDash and Uber and Lyft and Grubhub aren't selling your data, they you haven't read the terms of service. Yeah. It's in yeah. there. They yeah, say they it. And, they say and we not sell only your that, data. they are tracking every single thing you do in that app. Every time you touch the screen, Every time yep. they're tracking every single thing. They want to know how often how often you touch it. They want to know when you touch this button, what do you touch next? I mean, why, or why do you oh, why we used to uh, we used to run these things at Uber, right? Where it's like we can tell that you exited the Uber app for 15 seconds and then came back and toggled between them, and we would know that you were basically deciding whether you should take an Uber or a Lyft trip. And then we'd run a whole set of different things just based right. off of that. Right, right. Exactly. And well, and both and both of you guys probably remember this when you download the Uber app, especially many years ago. The default option was, um, you know, one of those settings where when you first launch it, it says, uh, "Can Uber know where you are while using the app or all the time?" Right. It was pushing for that all the time. Where even if like you're you're just out with your friends, if you had chosen all the time it's running in the background and it's tracking you going to the movies to the grocery store to the yeah. i mean you guys like you really i mean i know all of us click david and i have talked about this probably a hundred times you click i agree we all do it we don't read that stuff right yeah there's very few people that read it very few people well uh david and steve i hope that this has assuaged some people's concerns um, I'm sure there's going to be more questions after this. We can do a follow-up, whether it's on a podcast or something like that. I think that. David just said it. And I, I said it great though, too, that if honestly, if you feel I, I'm a, of this opinion for me as a gig worker, if you feel uncomfortable with it, don't use it. Right. Yeah. Bottom line. I mean, like there, there should be the, the out right there that should end the conversation because yeah. if you don't feel I think comfortable, I have one other thing to add. Or, which is, you know, if you do sign up and you're uncomfortable, you can always delete your account details yourself. You can also always email myself or privacy, like david at woodpair.com or privacy at woodpair.com. We will ensure that absolutely everything is deleted from our system also. So right. that is sort of our, our guarantee. And I know that sort of the onus is on us to win trust. And I hope yeah. I can do that with some people. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah. And the whole, I mean, you, that's a whole other can of worms is what do people do when, when you say you want to disable your account? I mean, that's, yeah. we could be yeah. here for, for another, <laughs> that's, that's another podcast. That's another podcast. Yeah. That. yeah. But right. I appreciate your time guys. Um, and uh, I hope we can talk again soon. Oh yeah. Thanks for having me, John. Uh, Anita. Yeah. We'd love to, we'll do it again. So. All right. <laughs> Once again, I want to thank Steve and Dave for agreeing to be interviewed. Uh, I, appreciate it. And if you have any more questions for them, please leave them in the comments below. I suspect that there are going to be people who have more questions and I want to be able to address those in the future. If these are the kinds of videos that you like to see when it comes to the gig economy and gig apps, hey, give it a like. And of course, you can always subscribe to the channel if you want to see what I'm doing on a regular basis. Until next time, remember that just because you're in a small market, it doesn't mean you need to settle for small profits. Bye.